Welcome to Weather Notes. Right off the bat, I want to explain the big difference between climate and weather um, because there seems to be a lot of confusion in the public about this. Climate is kind of what you expect to happen. It's long-term averages for a certain region or part of Earth. Whereas weather is what's happening with the weather right here, right now. So when it comes down to it, what really is weather? Well, it's what's happening with temperature, air pressure, wind, and moisture in the air at a specific time and place on Earth. So if it weren't for Earth receiving energy from the sun, we really wouldn't have weather here on planet Earth. It's all about how we receive that sun and how that energy is moved around and changed and shifted and transferred from one place to another that really results in us experiencing weather the way we do here. So if you think about weather, what you're really thinking about are these six different weather factors. Because if you had the ability to change one or a few of them, you would essentially be able to control or adjust the weather at your will. Each factor kind of plays its own role, but when you put them all together, this is really what weather is all about. So one of the most basic weather factors is temperature. And temperature is really talking about how much heat energy there is from the sun in the air. So when you think about temperature, we normally think of hot and cold, but really it's just different amounts of heat. Cold would be a very, very small amount of heat, and you know, warm or hot would obviously be more. Hey everybody, Vince Cadella from Fox 6 with our video weather notes. Can you see or feel the moisture that's in the air? We can easily see it anytime you have a, a cold glass of water, let's say, on a very warm and humid day. The ice cubes inside this glass chill the outside of the glass, drop the temperature down to the dew point, and then the moisture that's in the air condenses out onto the side of the glass. And there's the concept, dew point. So many people are confused. They like relative humidity because they've always heard that concept, but they don't understand dew point. Here's one way to think about it. It's what the temperature that we need to cool the air down to in order for water to condense. So if I can drop this air temperature on the side of this glass down to our dew point, any moisture, invisible moisture, water vapor that's in the air, we can make visible and condense it out. Here's another way to think about relative humidity. It's relative to the actual air temperature. So consider these two boxes. They're very different in size. This would be representative of very warm air. It can hold a lot of moisture. It has the capacity to hold a lot of moisture. This is representative of cold air. It can't hold as much moisture as warm air can. Well, relative humidity is relative to the actual air temperature. So let's say if the relative humidity is 50%, well, that means that half of the air is filled with its capacity for water vapor. Well, 50% of this is a lot more than 50% of this. So a 50% relative humidity on a warm day is a lot more moisture in the air than 50% relative humidity on a cool day. So again, relative humidity is relative to the air temperature and it differs depending on the actual temperature of the air. The better measure is dew point. And by the way, dew point's a great measure for comfort. Dew point's below 60 degrees, pretty comfortable for all of us. Dew points above 70, getting very sticky and uncomfortable for most of us as well. So it's sort of a mindset, a change in definition. Dew point much more representative of the moisture that's in the air compared to relative humidity. Hello. Today we're talking about how clouds form. Now, there's always moisture in the air. We call it humidity a lot of times, but it's water vapor. That's just water in its gaseous state. And it's invisible, but there's water vapor in the air always. Now, here's how a cloud forms. Once you start to have a rising parcel of air, as it rises, it cools. And as it cools, that gets down to the dew point. And once it reaches the dew point, that gaseous state of liquid will immediately change into a liquid state. It will form, it will go from a gas 
to a liquid. And when that happens, you get tiny, tiny drops of water, and that is what makes up a cloud. So again, the process is as you have rising air, that parcel of air cools. As it cools, it reaches the dew point, and immediately when it reaches the dew point, the moisture in the air goes from a gas to a liquid, or in other words, goes from water vapor to a liquid to the clouds. When you have enough water molecules inside of a cloud and they become too heavy, they fall out of the cloud. So any type of water, whether it's solid, liquid, or somewhere in between that falls out of a cloud is what we call precipitation. So generally speaking, air pressure is how much the air above you or above a given location is pressing down on an area. But two things that can directly affect air pressure are temperature and moisture because of the effect they have on the density of air. So if you have hot, very humid, moist air, that's going to be low pressure air. And on the flip side, if you have cool, very dry air, that's going to be uh, the type of air that exerts the most air pressure. Why is high pressure associated with clear skies and light winds and low pressure associated with storms and rain? Well, we're going to put it, toge put it uh, together this way. You have to look at weather as three-dimensional. That's the key here. That was one of the most difficult things when I went to college when they started talking about the weather in three dimensions. I was so used to just staring at weather maps that I'd see in the newspaper here um, down at the ground. But everything at the ground is occurring by what's happening aloft here. So let's look at the jet stream. This is the jet stream here. And this is high and low pressure here. Now, you have to understand the water cycle, too. Water cycle is as air rises, it will cool and then condense because it, it encounters lower pressure. So the higher air rises, the pressure goes from high pressure to low pressure. You get less pressure, less temperature. It cools and condenses, makes clouds. So wherever there's rising air, we get precipitation. This is what's happening in the jet stream aloft. Here we'll have a convergence zone aloft here. That's when the jet stream winds are con coming together. So as you push the air together, it has nowhere else to go. It can't go up, so it has to go down. And so what happens is we have sinking air, and the air sinks, and it sinks clockwise. So it subsides, as we call it, subsidence. As it's sinking, it warms because it encounters the higher pressure near the ground, and that sinking air also causes a big bubble of high pressure to form here. So sinking air near the high pressure warms and dries, and so you don't have any cloud cover out. We had that pretty much during the day today. As the jet stream is going along, it'll encounter an area where it diverges aloft, and so it separates the air here. We can't have a void. We can't make a vacuum of no air. So something has to replace the air right here, and so air comes up from the ground. So what happens is high pressure now has been over here, so that wind comes out of high pressure, it goes into low pressure counterclockwise, it gets to the middle with nowhere else to go, and it rises to fill this void right here. And so near low pressure, we have rising air, and rising air will then cool and condense and make clouds and precipitation, so you basically have rising air causing clouds and rain, while sinking air is generally dry as it warms up. And if you look at high pressure, low pressure on the ground at the surface here, you also have wind that forms between the two. And as I mentioned to the kids, if I take a room and we fill it up with air, we seal it off and we pump a bunch of air pressure inside the room, then we open the door, the air will rush from high pressure to low pressure outside the door. And because the earth is spinning, it goes around clockwise like this. And so we added a little bit extra here, but generally stormy, not stormy. That's what you got to take away from that, Don. The word wind can mean many things. It can be peaceful, violent, powerful, exciting, bitingly cold, or searingly hot. Wind is everywhere, all the time. But where exactly does it come from? I mean, it's only air, which we've talked about a little before. But there are no fans or turbines or giant people in the sky blowing the air around. So where does the wind come from? Even when you don't feel the wind, the air is never totally still. If you zoomed way in, you'd see air molecules bouncing around, colliding with each other, and everything around them. Now, all that bumping and bashing creates a force. It's the force of all those bouncing air molecules over a given area of Earth that results in pressure. The air has mass, and gravity drives that air down towards the ground. That's why there's more air pressure down here than there is, say, on top of Mount Everest. 
the average atmospheric pressure on Earth is about one bar, or 100,000 pascals. But luckily, that pressure isn't pushing straight down. The force goes out in all directions, so we aren't squished into pancakes. Wind is what happens when air moves from high pressure to low. Anyone who's ever watched the weather knows that air pressure isn't the same everywhere, and that's because of temperature. Air near the equator is heated by the energy of the sun, so it becomes less dense and it rises. Near the poles, there's not as much heating by the sun, and that cold, dense air sinks down toward the Earth. Right along the equator, that creates this area with almost no wind called the doldrums. But wind doesn't come straight from the north or south. The Earth is turning, and because the atmosphere isn't attached to Earth, that causes the wind to curl and rotate. That's known as the Coriolis effect. If you want to experience that, just try to play catch on a merry-go-round. Pressure and temperature combine with a rotating Earth tilted on its axis and covered in sun-absorbing land masses. The winds of the Earth begin to swirl like a Van Gogh painting. So begins the swirling cycle of heating, cooling, and rotation that drives everything from gentle breezes to destructive hurricanes. Sometimes a little science can just blow you away. Yeah.